Right, <laughs> Ian Phillips, who's a visiting professor at Liverpool and Plymouth, who's going to tell us that they're not making Athens any smaller. Thank you, Ian. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you. Am I alive? I'm alive. Look at that. We have the technology. Um, I'll introduce myself a little bit because it might try help to put some sort of context into this. Until a year ago, I used to be principal staff engineer at ARM. Uh, most of you will have heard of ARM, I guess. Uh, and if you haven't, then somewhere along the way you'll find out something, something about it. But if you've got yourself a smartphone, then you've got an ARM, and you've probably got lots of them. It's the Intel inside everything that isn't a de on a desktop. So all of your intelligent products are ARM-powered. Now, I say that because a year ago I retired, and retirement is a big disconnect in a life, because up till that time, I'd been working on becoming an engineer. You know, I, I was in school, and I became aware of the idea of engineers, and I became an, en well, I became an engineer. I continued to strive. I, I personally, have, uh, other people have called me an engineer. I've always felt that I was still working on it. Uh, it was an endless challenge, and uh, when you get to 50 years and then somebody says, thank you, and you go out through the door, you suddenly realize that this challenge, which has been with you all, all of your life up until that point, isn't with you anymore. Um, well, it's still there because I'm not going to forget it, but nevertheless, it, uh, it's take, they want to take it away. Um, but that, with that pause that came along with it, I ended up looking back and realized how remarkable the last 50 years of my life have been because essentially they've been aligned with the history of solid-state electronics. And of course this has been a wonderful thing, it's been a marvelous story from the, from the very first stirrings in this domain through to you know, what the, the electronics that we have in the products around us today. So to my mind, this is a, I put this together and it's a bit of a, it's not a, a, a drag through history or anything like that, but it is a histo history lesson, but it's a history lesson which I hope is going to give you some of the uh, insights of being an engineer that it's given me and I w would like to pass on to other people who are still being engineers or still trying to be engineers. So with no further ado, I will move on. So of course, most of you will be aware that this is where it started, but it is worth remembering that it is just 70 years since the, f since the first transistor. There was no solid state electronics to speak of before then. There was diodes before that, and that was it. Um, but this, the, the, the diodes, most of the technology, most of the physics of diodes wasn't appreciated. And so when, when uh, Shockley and Bardeen and Britton were uh, working on this, they had only got this kind of vague idea that if they stuck some electrodes kind of close together that something interesting might happen. It did, and it turned out to be a transistor, but they didn't understand the physics of what they were doing. They were still playing with it. Now, of course, once you've got this thing that works, then you start to become interested in explaining why it works. And so at that point, you start creating models of things. I understand that uh, you know, Shockley wasn't a terribly nice man. He was the team leader. Uh, and that Bardeen and Britain did most of the work, but Shockley is the guy who gets remembered. There's a certain element of familiarity in that, that some things <laughs> don't change. Anyway, it was a, 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 uh, a variable resistor with a control element. And it's interesting to, to see that even in that first transition, the first example, the first demonstrator of the concept, and the first practical, let's call it, junction transistor, didn't really look the same. This made the, had a better understanding of the physics of the device here. I've got a pointer, I can actually, whoa, technology. Um, <laughs> this, this implementation here had already changed from the implementation there. And this is, this is good because it means that they had some better understanding of the theory, or at least an outline of what might be going on, that they could create an implementation which wasn't the same, but would actually still work in the same way. I want to bear that one in mind. Now, 1951, and I think about the other thing on that one was, that was uh, 1947. I was born in 1949, so this is down close. This is just two years before I was born. Anyway, the first practical transistor 
was of course 1951. So by that year, time I was two, wasn't terribly interested in electronics, but I got the idea. Obviously, somebody had told me that transistors are going to be where there's a lot of interesting action going on. This is a transistor, and yet again, it's still the same thing. You still have a base and an emitter and a collector, but the implementation of it has now changed yet again. This is a much better transistor. It's got a better gain. It's got better electrical characteristics. And very quickly, by 1954, the OC71 appeared. How many people remember the OC71? <laughs> exactly. <laughs> it's not only your first transistor, it's everybody's first transistor. And as far as I can see, it still is. You can still get the OC71. They don't encapsulate them in glass anymore, so you can't use them as photo detectors. Right, you used to be able to. That's one of the little tricks you had up your sleeve. Now the thing that's it, that I want to bring in here is the difference between architecture and implementation because we've had several different implementations of an architecture which was basically the same, a transistor. People had by now realized that this transistor action was interesting and they theorized about other ways that you might put them together, devices might be put together and of course, not surprisingly, they had a theory which backed up and you actually started to have other implementations which were not only possible but were, uh, could be realized and demonstrated. An important point though, these may be pennies today, but they were pounds back then. And it made you a lot more conscious about how you used it. Now, if we were talking today's transistors where you have hundreds of millions of them and more on a chip, then you certainly couldn't afford them to be a pound a piece. So something had to happen in the meantime, which has made a big, a big difference in that domain. So a very significant thing then, 60 years ago, was when uh, Gene Honey uh, conceived the architecture of the planar transistor. And that's, you know, it, it doesn't really strike at the time, and I remember looking at it and thinking to, me, to myself, so what? You've got three connections on the top surface, whereas previously one, were the, one of them was on the other side. It doesn't really make a better package device. But of course it was Kirby who realized that what, you, what you're talking about here is the basis of an integrated circuit. He didn't make an integrated circuit, well not out of a single substrate. He had two pieces of uh, <coughs> uh, uh, silicon and he had three components. But the concept was there and I think that that's important. This is 1957 so we're still, we're still tick ticking along. It's a pace which is interesting though. And don't forget 1947 was the first demonstration of a transistor. Ten years later, we were, we were messing around with architectures which were leading to uh, integrated circuits. Now that was the first commercial integrated circuit, 1961. Um, we had the birth of the solid state digital integrated circuit. Digital. This is, this is a digital transit. This is a digital integrated circuit. The other ones are just transistors. It, the first demonstrated integrated circuit with uh, uh, Horney, was it? Um, his was just an analog circuit, a very simple one, three components. It really wasn't digital, but this is the first digital integrated circuit. Four transistors, two resistors, and it cost $120. Um, and it was pretty small, though, don't forget. This, that's a dime, and a dime's about the same size as a penny. And uh, that was an integrated circuit. You can start to see that people were already saying, wow, this, this technology is pretty scary. Look, we've got six components on that, and it's less than the size of a penny. The pre previously, when you, when you assembled a, um, a circuit, you used tag strips. You had discrete devices. You soldered them onto the tag strips. It was uh, arcane technology, but this was revolutionary stuff. Robert Noyce incidentally founded Fairchild Semiconductors to make this. That was, that's what he did it for. That's a stunning thing to do. Now, again, to put it in context, this is what we were talking about designing at that time, 1965. About this time that I was becoming an apprentice, but we were doing designs when I started with the MOD, literally drawing devices like this because there was a, there were some discrete plastic modules that you could get which had transistor-transistor uh, logic inside them. They had about 10 components in each one of these plastic blobs and people were designing circuits, adders, with lo of this kind of, a, uh, using this kind of approach, namely um, uh, logic, uh, uh, 
logic architectural descriptions rather than the transistors that went inside them and that was a revolution. So this is 30 to 40 components uh, in an integrated circuit by the time you put it onto there. That's a 74,000 series and that's a slide rule. And again, not many people will remember that or certainly remember how to use it. Um, and the other part of it, the hand thing, that was the EDA. Anyway, in 1965, this or that level of circuit was what Gordon Moore was designing when he had this idea that he'd noticed that, if you, that in going from the 30, 40 component ICs that he was doing, the level of the quad 2 input NAND gate, he was now being asked to design circuits with around 80 components in it. And that's what he said, that by 1975, there could be as many as 65,000 components on an integrated circuit, the way that this was going. And of course, um, <coughs> Gordon Moore, his law, being extended way, way beyond what he ever anticipated, 65,000 components. It really means that Gordon Moore's law was not a, a projection for the great future at all. It was just an observation about what he, what he was doing in the near term. It's marketing which has taken it forward, and it has become the driving force for a continued evolution, but it's an exponential ev evolution. I want to dwell a little bit more on this architecture thing, um, because one of the things that's puzzled me for a, a long time was uh, why you could make a radio back before I got into this electronics business. Um, it had valves. Uh, but still essentially it's the same as the radio today and it's the separation of architecture and implementation. This is a diagram of an FM receiver. You all recognize it, it's a block diagram. You don't have any problem recognizing that each one of these blocks actually implements a mathematical function. You know, there's an RF amplifier which is a gain block, you've got a mixer which is a multiplier, an IF amplifier which is a uh, bandpass filter and uh, with gain. You know, these are fairly simple mathematical functions. So that radio, however you choose to implement it, is a signal processing exercise. It's just how, how good the, the multiplier is. Is it a linear multiplier or is it, is it reproducible? The question is, uh, to ask that question is relevant, but actually from a practical radio point of view back in those days, if it worked, it was a good enough multiplier. You know, it, now if you want to use a higher technology to do that and make the multiplier more precise, then you pay for it. You pay for it somewhere else and you get some gains. So not surprisingly then, the first implementations of this in valves, and I've been there, I've done, didn't design valves, but I've certainly debugged de uh, <coughs> valve circuitry. You could actually repair electronics in those days too, which you can't do anymore. But you, they brought things in to back into a repair shop to be fixed. Can you fix my radio, please, because it's broken? Now you say, can you fix my radio? No, go down to Argos and buy yourself a new one. <coughs> transistors, seven transistors versus five transistors was very much one of the discussions that we had in school when I was there. You know, I've got a seven transistor radio. Oh, mine's only a five transistor radio. Anybody remember Radio Luxembourg? Yes. Our first introduction to the devil, pop music, wasn't it? <laughs> and then, of course, you can put it into an integrated circuit these days. And, and actually, at this point, you don't know what's going on inside there because it could be all digital, it could be software, it could be analog, it could be a combination of all of them. And the reality is it probably is a combination of all of them. The thing is, the function inside the box is still the same. The, it's just the implementation detail of it which has changed. And it's only changed to make something which is more commercially valuable. You want to sell something to a consumer. It's a market-driven exercise. You want to sell something to the consumer, and that something is better signal quality, more reliability, um, maybe even power efficiency, all sorts of things that people are prepared to pay for. Clearly... Even as recently as the, I'm not sure, I haven't got a date on this one, but this is the pure evoke device, style was not an issue. People didn't buy radios for what they looked like. So I don't think that's an improvement really, is it? 
So style hasn't made an appearance. So we've got the same architecture in the box, but the implementation using cu current available technology and methods realizes more commercially attractive products. I want to pick on that, currently available technology and methods. Why didn't the designer of the valve radio just use transistors? It would have been so much easier. The answer, of course, is that transistors weren't available when he was designing that radio. Similarly, they couldn't use integrated circuits when they were designing this radio. It's a small point, but the job of an engineer is to deliver a product. So you couldn't say, I can't design a, trans I can't design a radio because integrated circuits haven't been designed yet. He had to design a radio because he was, you know, his boss told him, design a radio or you're out on your ear. This is a product driven thing. This is improved, and he, but he couldn't wait until the uh, next generation either. He had to use the technology available. And that's one of the most important parts about being a design engineer, which I had never thought about. And that is you're always constrained in what you do by the technology and the methods that are available to you. And those are actually, it's more specifically, it's not just the, method, the technology and methods which are available to the industry, it's the technology and methods which are available to you working for the company that you're working for. So somebody else out there may have the access to integrated circuits, but if your company doesn't, then you can't use them. So it's, uh, the, it, is, it is very geographic, uh, very specific. And methods. It's not just a case of the technology, it's a case of how you use the technology. Now those things then, available technology and the methods for using it, are two of the great undersold things of being a design engineer. Because as a design engineer, you have to continually be aware of the emergence of new technologies. And a, a, a product, whatever your product is, has a vast range of technologies. It's not just... The, uh, the, the smallest geometry CMOS process. It is actually a range of different electronic processes and whether you're going to use software or not. Um, and uh, you know, whether you can make this thing, whether you have the technology to assemble components, whether you can use discrete resistors or whether you can actually print resistors. All of these things, somebody who's designing a modern radio or any other electronic widget, widget has to make a conscious engineering decision about because if it's a good decision, it'll end up being a good product. If it's a bad decision, your competitor will have a better product. And that means you'll lost the market today. So moving right on, by 1970, we were looking at what was called large-scale integration. This is the breakthrough which took you from uh, the small number of transistors right up to the heady grounds of 75 gates or 300 transistors. This is all pretty small stuff. But this was an interesting device because it was the, it is recognized as the first uh, large-scale integration. And it's an ALU, a 4-bit ALU. And I, I'm going to pick on that one because this one illustrates quite nicely how digital scales. So it, it's an ALU, which means it does a set of logical functions between two inputs. Not wildly exciting, but it is an essential part of a computer. And the other thing that was nice about this one is that you could increase the width by putting several of these down on an integrated circuit, or in, sorry, on a printed circuit board, or you could put them into your next integrated circuit as one implementation. So they could make their next integrated circuit, if the process technology had shrunk, then you could put four of these on one, on one die, and you can now have a 60, uh, four, four 16 bit uh, ALU on your integrated circuit. And you could continue to double it without having to do serious amounts of redesign. You had, you'd introduced, by going to this abstract logic level, you'd introduced a level of shrink support in the design process, which had never been there before. So it's the, the, the process of designing had become largely geometry independent. You could also implement that on bipolar if you wanted to or gallium arsenide, or CMOS, it, or I-squared C logic. The logic was an adequate description of the functionality. The implementation technology gave you features which were either desirable for you or not. Again, the design engineer would have had to know and be aware that when he was designing his products, he was going to be making a choice of technology, 
and that technology would impact the product and if he didn't make the right decisions then he was going to end up producing a poor product so this this role of an engineer to think outside the box I believe explains quite nicely to me why I consider I always struggled to be an engineer because I was always having to look at the things that I didn't know very well the stuff that I did know how to do you just did that it was the the challenge of having to go out there all the time and be aware of the stuff around you that you could use on your next de generation design was actually a, a, a challenge it also meant that you didn't know you weren't basing your design experience on having done or used that technology or that particular variance or that tool or that methodology before it was always new you were doing something which was challenging and that challenging was the introduction of something which is new anyway by now we come to the first arm cpu 1985 this was the coprocessor for the bbc computer and that was its first implementation but the processor actually ended up in the archimedes computer which most people most people with any kind of gray hairs will have some knowledge of the bbc it was great in its day but to put some scale on it that four bits of ALU that we were talking about is now there. This is a die, which is a modest size die. I'm not going to go on to the overall size. It was about three millimeters square, four millimeters maybe. But that four bit ALU in 10 years had ceased to be a whole chip full and had become just that tiny part of a chip. <coughs> just five years later, um, had this idea of selling the CPU as a cell to put into a larger integrated circuit. So there's the CPU now, the whole CPU, the ALU is down here somewhere. Just five years later, the chip had not become a chip in itself, it had become a fraction of the chip. And that I think is a startling thing as well, because we all know about Moore's law. We know how, f we know how fast it goes. It goes times two every 18 to, 18 to 24 months. But actually seeing it like this shows you that it, it's not just fast, it's unbearably fast. So anyway, by now this, this um, arm set as a cell <coughs> was 50,000 gates and 200,000 transistors. We've moved up quite a bit, still only 1991. <coughs> now I, I use this graph which I pulled from the International Technology Roadmap for Silicon back in 1999. I still use it today um, and I use it despite the fact that it's that old because it actually it goes back to 1981 which is definitely the era of these first devices that we were talking about. It also has another line on here which the International Technology Roadmap for Silicon don't talk about anymore. This was productivity so it was the number of gates an engineer could put down per month, per week. You choose your own units. Uh, I also stick this arrow on it, which gives some idea of the process geometry that we're talking about at that time. Now, of course, it's easy enough to extend that forward to today, broadly speaking. So it doesn't, doesn't radically change the, the graph. But when ARM came into being in 1991, so this is the concept of using the ARM as a cell on an integrated circuit, uh, so you can put other stuff around it, but here's a computer which is going to give it life and intelligence. I was talking about uh, integrated circuits which had around a million transistors on it. So that, that chip diagram that I showed you just a few minutes ago was a million transistors. Now, we know how much things have moved on. I mean, uh, back in 2009, you could buy 20 billion transistors for 5 euros in a memory chip. Now... 20 billion is a big number, isn't it? And a million is a big number. And it's sometimes very difficult to understand what the difference in those two are. But if you, if you put it in, a, uh, in an ARM terms, between when ARM started, when I joined the company, when it kicked off, uh, and it was 2015 when I did this calculation, there were 20,000 times more transistors on an integrated circuit. That's... 20,000 times. So this concept of just plug, plugging an ARM CPU onto a piece of silicon, it's still the same concept. That's still what ARM does. But the number of transistors in the rest of the integrated circuit, 20,000 times more. And they also go 10 times faster. 
during that time as well. Now, broadly speaking, to me, that says 200,000 times more functionality on that piece of silicon. Just like that. 20,000 times more transistors, 10 times faster. You can run them 10 times faster. Now, if I was building a house, that's one house, okay, one integrated circuit. It represents the combined effort of a bunch of engineers working on different things, and they produce the chip, and they send it away to fab, and it comes back, and they put it in a test box, and it works. B, celebration. I want to build uh, around 20,000 houses now, and I want to do it with, broadly speaking, the same effort, and roughly speaking, the same time. Now, this is like building a town, a small town, I grant you. So we're now asking our engineers between when ARM started, which is not long ago, and today, to be building the equivalent of a small town with a team that back there in 1991, the same size team as they, uh, today. Now, you can only do that if you've done something pretty radical with your productivity because you certainly can't design everything at the level that it was designed back then. That level of change is another one of those things that I've been struggling with and hadn't really realized what I was struggling with. But we were having to do different design methodologies. We were having to incorporate HDL languages. We were, software was part of it. The use of CPUs inside electronic products, which didn't need any software. You've got engineers who are not software engineers who have to learn about software. And you've got engineers who were software engineers who have to learn about hardware. This, this, whole, com this whole thing has emerged in this improvement in productivity which goes along there. Again, a thing that's, that's tended to happen is people tend to think about integrated circuits as one team. Now, one team, okay, you can make an integrated circuit, but the processes which have gone on in the background have involved teams working together. So it's not just, I've, I've got a fab, and in my fab I've got a process, and people hand over a design and I fabricate that process. You've had people who've had to be working on transistor and process architectures, photolithography, masks, photochemistry, the manufacturing machinery, the measuring tools necessary to look at what you've got, what you've created, the handling equipment, because an awful lot of this, it's so, it's so clean and, uh, and it's got to be handled and aligned and positioned with accuracies which are phenomenal and they're done mechanically. Um, process and environmental control, understanding of physics, the, the necessity, to, the ability to make smaller transistors, and here's a section of one, um, means that you've got to understand the physics better. You can't just keep on churning it out with the old black magic approach now. These transistors are getting so small, it's getting difficult. So you really have got to know what the atoms are doing, what the atoms are doing in the, in the transistor. This is Asan Asanov's work from uh, Glasgow University. Well, he's, he's now doing atomic level modeling of transistors because the transistors have got so small that the number of atoms in them have got smaller. And uh, the processing power that small transistors gives you enables him to model the actual blooming atoms inside a transistor and come up with really useful information. This guy, in, he, he started this work. And he just theorized that it was possible. He has become a world leader from Glasgow University, all of the process guys in the world are using his modeling now to predict what their, what their processes, their future processes are going to look like. Not surprisingly, of course, the methodology applies to any small transistors. And there's an awful lot of focus these days on transistors. Look over here. This is a cross section of a typical trip, chip. And you also see something here. There are 10 layers of metal interconnect here. The first ch uh, chip that we designed had one layer of metal and three masks. This one's got uh, 14 masks in the metal alone. And right down here at the bottom of all of this stack is the active layer. That's where the transistors are. The transistors are still planar. They're still sitting right at the bottom, but they can be connected together in a very ingenious way. Anyway, this is all the sort of thing that has been continually going on in the background just to make planar transistors 0.7 times their linear dimensions every 18 to 24 months. And people have had breakthroughs in each one of them, one after another, and they keep on rippling through, and the pace of change gives you new processes which align remarkably with this thing that Gordon originally projected 
and that the market has continued to improve. But in 70 years, the silicon atom is still the same size as it was in Schottky's uh, conceptual demonstrator. The atom hasn't got any smaller. The transistors have got a lot smaller, a lot smaller. Crikey, huge amounts smaller, 20,000 times smaller since arms started. I'm now getting to a point where we're bumping into the atoms. 130 nanometers was probably the last time that you could consider the, um, the transistor in a totally uh, block approach, gate, drains and source, gate oxides and, and body. You didn't need to think about it in an atomic concept at all. It was bulk behavior. 90 nanometers, and uh, there's a lot of talk about exactly when it happened, but the changeover was 90 or 100 nanometers, where the transistor's behavior was now being influenced by the actual atoms. And in particular, the most sensitivity was the atoms here, where you're putting in roughly one in a million dopant atoms on the surface, which is going to determine the characteristic of the transistor. It frequently meant, after this time, that the one dopant which was going to make a transistor uh, a junction P or N type wasn't even under the transistor. It's just the influence, the long distance influence of having a dopant, an impurity atom in, a, in an otherwise pure matrix. 28 nanometers, we're definitely looking at lumpiness. And 14 nanometers, and where are we today? We're roughly 22 nanometers today, somewhere in this line. This is where the commercial um, hotspot is. People are demonstrating transistors down to about three nanometers. We're definitely, that's definitely into this domain. But one of the things that, that, that happens, 10, 10, seven nanometers will probably be the realistic smallest transistor ever. And that's not far away. So we're already at 22 nanometers. If the, if the pace of uh, change, um, doubling every 18 to 24, then you're talking of three to six years. Um, then it's got to end. Now, the, the thing is, it's already ex extremely painful. Uh, the, the thing called Denard scaling, which has been a wonderful thing for, for most of the 50 years, um, this has given you, every time you shrunk the, trans the uh, chip, every time you shrunk your design, it consumed less power and it went faster and it was cheaper because it was smaller. But Denard scaling stopped in 2005. After 100 nanometers, the power started flattening, so you didn't get a power saving. The speed didn't go up because you had to reduce the voltage. You couldn't keep the, uh, the, the ch chips working at full voltage anymore. So the cost benefits were of scaling had stopped because the masks were more expensive. So these were devices now where you were paying more, the yield was less, the power was higher, the thing that you were gaining was smaller. That's the only thing that you got out of it. The rest of it was, was going, dis disappearing very quickly. It became obvious that it was very difficult to make nanoscale features on chip. The masks involved in making it. I was talking to somebody earlier about it. Um, the, the, the photolithography, we're talking about a million pounds a mask layer now. You're talking about billions of features on each one of those masks. And the masks are not regular structures anymore. They're actually uh, interference patterns. So you've effectively got to design a hologram and then implement it on a, uh, a mask. And those masks, not surprisingly, cost over a million each. And if you're doing 10, 10 layers chips with transistors at the bottom, there's a lot of mask cost, which means that these chips they may be making use of very small transistors, but they are very expensive. The yield isn't great either. The yield has gone downhill. The, um, our major changes to trans transistor architecture. Um, frequently I hear the, the phrase, it's not too literally true, but they're using half the periodic table in, in uh, wafers these days. I mean, essentially, the early days it was silicon and uh, uh, arsenic for Im impurities, and then you've got uh, aluminium for the, for the metal, and this is silicon oxide. That was, that was your integrated circuit. Now there are so many more that they have, to be, they have to use to try and control the electrical characteristics of the transistor. So not surprisingly then we have a huge increase in process complexity and cost and significantly reduced yield and, uh, 
and reliability. And that's today. The statistical nature of the atoms is showing through as well. Not all, you can say that an atom is there perhaps, but what you can't say is whether it's going to be making an effect on, uh, on this transistor this time or that, that transistor the next time, which makes it impossible today to make a chip where all the transistors work. Now that's an interesting figure. This is mathematically provable. You can't, the yield of transistors, working transistors, um, is sufficiently low that the, and the number of transistors on a die is sufficiently high that you can't guarantee anymore that the transistors are going to work. And the problem is because this is uh, statistical intrinsic variability, you can find the transistor which doesn't work on this die, but it will be a different transistor on the next die. So it's not, it's not a mask failure, it's not a process control failure, it's actually the intrinsic variability caused by atoms. And that was a big discovery that the fab guys didn't appreciate, and it's where Asanov, Asanov made his, made his uh, name. So the end for shrinking planar transistors is definitely in sight. It's not only in sight, we're, we're already tripping over the threshold of it. It's there, it's there today. So is that the end? Well, we're going to have to come back to that. But if you can't make them smaller, you can stack them higher. So you don't have to try and make your planar transistor. This is your, a cross-section of your planar transistor. So there's the drain and source. There's the uh, gate. And there's a little thin oxide along there, which makes that the channel. Now, the planar transistor has served us very well. But now we're having to move to this FinFET architecture where the transistor stands upright. And it's called 2.5D for that. It's now the transistor is standing upright from the surface. It's moved into that vertical space somehow. But it is still very, very low. We're still talking about something here which is still low nanometers high. Uh, but that gives you a transistor now whose drain is here, whose source is there, or the other way around. And the gate wraps around it. It's called FinFET. Most of the uh, requirement for state-of-the-art CMOS today uses that. 22 nanometer and below 14 nanometer in some cases. Fundamentally depends on this. They can't, you can't make transistors that small and planar. They've already moved into the third dimension. But this is a very small movement into the third dimension. As I say, it's pretty, pretty low nanometers high. Um, the next stage on this is, is definitely going to be the use of nanowires. Now, hey, this is getting exciting because nanowires are you know, not regular structure. Nanowires are pretty well single threads of silicon atoms. You can wrap a gate around it. You don't have to worry about it being a crystal, perfect crystal because there's nothing else for it to be. It is a one-dimensional line and you can modulate it in just the same way as a FET transistor. And the thing about it is it's disconnected from the substrate. It is on top of the substrate because it's a conveni convenient thing to do. But as soon as you can start to build transistors which are disconnected from the substrate, then there's no limit. You can keep stacking them up on top of one another higher and higher. Here is an architecture which is in use today, NAND flash memory device, and it's got one, two, three, four, five, six transistors stacked on top of each other. There's the substrate at the bottom. That's the channel that runs up there. That's the gate oxide. It's a bit difficult to see. Incidentally, all of these slides will be available from my website. I don't know who else is going to have them, but they can certainly have them. Um, so these, these are transistors where it's possible to produce, to, possible to grow good enough quality silicon on top of the substrate going up and you're building transistors in between them. As soon as you start to do this, as soon as you start to go into the proper three, third dimension, then you can start to seriously think of having 30,000 times the capacity of a current integrated circuit today. And if you can think of how many transistors you can put in an integrated circuit today, multiply that by 30,000, then you know that there's a hell of a lot of capacity left once you start using the vertical dimension. Now, it's going to take a while to do it. We're up to five or six here. Uh, rumor has it there are some people who are doing 14. You can build 10 or 20 layers of metal on top of that. It's getting fairly good, but it's still got a long way to go before it is equally dense in X, Y, and Z dimensions. 
<clears throat> so a leap back in time. The driver for electronic technology in 1947 was high performance computing. And this is high performance computing, the first general purpose uh, computer produced uh, by Manchester University, uh, stored program general purpose computer. And the technology was valves, not surprisingly. Uh, but it still has an awful lot in common with the stored program computer that you'll find in whatever ele sophisticated electronic products you look around today. It has a store for instructions, it has a store for data, and it manipulates the, uh, uh, the data under the influence of the instructions. Um, so you'll find it then, of course, is the basis of everything that is in uh, all the microelectronic devices today, mainframes to laptops. It was a revolution, and it drove the technology. So is it fair to say then that current high-performance computing is also driving the technology? Because, I mean, this, no doubt, once you fill a room full of what you can produce in computing today, you have a scarily large amount of computing. You can predict weather. You can predict uh, airflow over aerodynamic surfaces. You can, you can predict the aerodynamic performances of cars before you actually design their structures. So surely this is going to be the, well, amongst the most challenging of applications. And surely then it must always be the, the front edge. Well, the answer is, the answer is, I pressed the wrong button again. No, it doesn't have the volume which today's um, processes which are frightfully expensive and frightfully complicated, it doesn't have enough volume. These are still here. The numbers of them are bigger than they used to be, but their numbers of them are still small. They're hundreds, not hundreds of millions, not billions. So today's drivers of technology are these guys. And these guys are not bought by professionals and experts, they're bought by consumers. People who who, who don't choose electronic products for the sophistication of the technology inside them. They choose them because they're pink or they're blue or they're shiny or whatever. And I think that that is one of the biggest disconcerting facts that we have to live with. That the things that are driving the technology development today are people who have no idea about the technology and no interest in it either. They're interested in the functionality, not the technology which is inside it. So we get this. Back here in 1970, the technologies, the thing that was driving the technology was the mainframe computer. It hasn't gone away. It's still there today. Its numbers are bigger. This is a log scale, but they're not huge. It was taken over a little while later. The market leadership was taken over by the mini computer, the personal computer, the desktop internet mobile internet and in due course will be taken over by the internet of things. These are, each one of these represents a substantial hike in the, uh, in the number of devices shipped, but they also represent a substantial hike in the total value of the market. And that's, that's the thing that drives it forward. It's only these very highest level things that means you're able to amortize the huge process development cost and the huge design costs associated with, with these devices. But it means that if you want to build a mainframe computer for a professional application, be it simulating nuclear weapons or weather, then the professional interest group have got to do it using the technologies, the processes which were developed essentially for consumer applications. Military, governments, they can't afford to develop a process that they would like to have down here. They have to use the processes which are available. So it's why today's high performance computers are making use of, for example, the CPU technology which is used in ARM. The latest Riken um, highest, perf highest performance HPC machine, they are currently the world's leader uh, they were displaced momentarily by a uh, Chinese supercomputer, but Riken is the research group of Fujitsu, I think, in Japan. They have chosen ARM CPU to go into their next machine, which is the, you know, the, the biggest, highest performance computer. That's commercial grade CPUs being put into highest performance computing applications you can imagine. That's scary but it's an illustration of just what's, what's captured on this market, on this graph. 
So you have to remember that a product is a commercial opportunity and a design engineer creates a viable solution using the technologies which are available. It's got to work. It's got to work. A pause on that one. If it doesn't work, you've failed. Whatever else has happened, the thing that you've got to do is make it work. Um, you don't get thanks for making it work because that's what you're expected to do. You get blamed if it doesn't. Uh, that's for sure. You will, not get a, you will not get a pay rise. You won't get promotion if it works. Um, it's got to be economical. It's got to, be, it's got to cost less than its value. You've got to be able to sell it for more than it costs you to make it. Uh, it's got to be reproducible. Hang on a minute. This means that the manufacturing process has to be included in the design process. We're not just designing a chip, we're designing a system which has to work. It's got to be manufacturable, it's got to have a yield which is acceptable, it's got to be distributable, it's got to be, it, you've got to be able to ship this thing to people who don't need to understand the technology to sell it to ordinary people in the street, which means it's got to have a human interface which is interfacing to humans as opposed to techies. You know, techies love technology. They're quite happy to learn how to live with a machine. People are not. They just want to use it as a diary or a, uh, a social media interface. It's got to be innovative. And this is one of the buzzwords of the moment, innovative. Everybody says we must do more innovation. Innovation is very easy. It just means you've got to be competitive. Whatever you're producing has got to be competitive with what the alternative is. Ideally, so competitive the, the, that the alternatives are all put out of the market. The other thing that a design engineer does is predict the future. Um, we've, we're all familiar with the ladies that sit in tents gazing into crystal balls. We're all aware of the, um, the, the predictions of the future that you read in the newspapers. Uh, we all laugh quietly, but we read them and we take them seriously. The difference between what engineers do and what they do is that we're making a prediction of the future with a very high probability that it's going to turn out right. Tell me any other area where people predict the future and it's got a high probability of it turning out right. We are so used to seeing this happen that we kind of expect engineers to do it and we blame them if they fail to do it. So they're going to project, project that it's going to deliver in a certain time, uh, deliver as promised, you're going to deliver the thing that you said you were going to deliver, when you promised it, that the costs were, were going to be within budget and the quality was going to be within budget. You know, we've all been beaten up on these things, but we have to remember that what we're doing here is a huge thing. We're predicting the future and we're being tested by our ability to deliver the future. Big round of applause for all engineers here. That's, there's nobody else that can do that. And they have to base it on the use of appropriate and available technology. I've already belaboured that point. Uh, but not the fanciest or newest or opti uh, optimistically promised, those are no good. Engineers have to deliver, therefore they have to rely on, process on processes and technologies and methodologies which are available. A promise of something, anti-gravity machine, uh, 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 superconductors or um, quantum computing, they can't build those into products which the company depends on until they can depend on the technology. It's another judgment that an engineer has to make is at what point do the technology set which are available to make this product become viable and the company life depends on it. And it's about working with others. This is not a lone job. It's not a lone job inside a company and the technologies are so broad and the expertise is required are so far ranging that it's not just teams inside the company, it's teams around the globe. Brexit it doesn't figure on this. These teams are already global teams. Whether there's a little club called Europe or not in it really doesn't make a show. Everybody already depends on these things, whatever their geopolitical boundaries. <coughs> um, it's about thinking around and about the problem and being ingenious. Ingenious, the root of engineer, of course. That's what we do. That's what I did. Hey, I'm proud of that. 
The design engineer's role involves endless learning and the application thereof. Oh, that's what I've done, 50 years. It suddenly has a context. I understand why it is a struggle. So let's look inside a couple of iconic products. The iPhone, everybody knows that. And we also know that if you want to get a knighthood for your contribution to technology, then you need to design the outside of one. <laughs> <coughs> Because the inside is black magic, and black magic is easy. We've all seen Harry Potter movies, right? You just put the magic word in, and it becomes a phone. Um, but design actually happens at many levels, and let's start to peel inside this, because um, we tend to forget, even when we're working on this ourselves, just how many levels of technology and just how much is inside these things. They're sealed together. You can't peel the lid off and have a look. <clears throat> I'm really going too slow. The vibration motor, so small, can't make it by hand, has to be made by machine. The camera, it's a module, 5 megapixel camera, but when way back then, and a video camera, incorporating LED flash, fits inside an 8 millimeter cube. Um, you f take a look at the control board, here's the, here's the electronic goobery which sits inside it. There's actually 20 chips in there. Most people think of a phone as having a chip in it, and probably a chip that was designed 20 years ago. <laughs> this is Samsung, Cirrus Logic, AKM, Texas Instruments. Uh, they're using various technologies, and uh, MOS, by CMOS, MEMS, uh, CMOS, analog CMOS, SOAR technology, um, a whole load of invisible uh, components, operating systems, drivers, stacks, applications. The, whole, the, the range of components that goes inside these things is enor enormous. There's the other side of the board, incidentally. Similar list of breakdown. But when you go searching for the integrated circuit, this is what package you find. The, there's the processor I see. This is a section now, looking through the package. It's got two memory devices, two memory chips, which are sitting above it inside the package. So this is two millimeters from top to bottom. That's not trivial technology, and yet it's not really noticed anywhere else. Uh, so when uh, those 20 chips, the design is important, but they're not the most important part of the product. All of the component technologies have to be there before the product works. It's as strong as the weakest link phenomena. It's not the transistor which is the most important part of this. It's the technology that doesn't work which is the most important part of this. Because if it doesn't work, your product doesn't go to market and the, bus the businesses rapidly fold. So the most important thing that you have on this is that all, all the components have to be available and they have to work. And it's not software, it's not hardware, it's not uh, mechanics or glass or display technology or RF. It's all of them. They're all important part of the design and they all have to be there before you've got a product. Just to give you some idea of what a transistor looks like, this is the, uh, it's the Tegra 3 chip from NVIDIA. Uh, this is back, uh, there's a date on there, 2012. Uh, it's, it's, it's convenient because they told me that this chip has a billion transistors in it. Uh, so it's a, it's a milestone. A billion transistors in it. You can see those, those are the ARM processor cores. They're now bigger, much more complex, much more capable processor cores than that little one I showed you earlier. So there's five of them here in the, in the floor plan. Uh, and if you sort of zoom into that, you start to see, well, not surprisingly, metal, which you can't really see very much of. You can't see much into it. But if you go into it with an electron microscope, you start to see there's a lot of connections. But where are the transistors? Well, actually, there are just three of the transistors there. So remember, there's a billion on this chip. So there's another, well, you, know, you take, a, take three away from a billion. It's beyond me at this time of night. But you also see that it's not just the number of transistors. It's the way you connect them together. The connectivity is a major factor of all of this lot. Uh, and, and indeed, there's probably another 100 in terms of integrated functionality if you include the increases in connectivity, which have happened in that same arm. Uh, era. So the, 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 the level of complexity which people are designing using methods which are essentially around reuse are much, much higher. Virtual components, bill of materials, a lot of people will be familiar with a bill of materials. These list all the physical components which theoretically if you put them together you get the phone. Uh, the virtual components 
are actually major parts because you can put all those components together, but if those virtual components are not there, then it still doesn't work. So these are, these are things which don't have a physical presence and they should be listed in the equivalent of that bill of materials. But in here is where th people like ARM have been doing their technology. So that productivity gap, which looks fairly innocent on that diagram, how, you have to remember these are log scales. So back in those days, it was taking around 100 person years to design a chip which involved ARM. If it continued using the same methodology, you'd be talking about 8,500. Well, today you'd probably be talking 20,000. You can't live with that level of productivity. The new thing that came, verification became a problem, but the thing that happened during that time was increased levels of reuse. Single designers became global teams. Clean sheet design actually became all the way through to expertise reuse. Nobody does clean sheet design anymore. <clears throat> um, so productivity has become the design uh, methodology driver. There's a, a, a Samsung, sorry, a SanDisk 19, mil, 19 nanometer, 128 gigabyte flash memory. Generally speaking, must have about 60 billion transistors on it. So that's fairly, fairly up to date. Presented with a box with 60 billion transistors in it, I want you to design a smartphone. Yeah, come on. A box of transistors. I can take a lump of metal and, and, and say it's got God knows how many billion atoms in it. It's no use unless it's configured. So the configuration is a major part of a design. Having a chip, a gate array or whatever with 60 billion transistors is easy. Make it into a product is the thing which is difficult. So you've got to be able to design a chip with a reasonable time, reasonable budget. Uh, otherwise, it's not there. Um, so companies like ARM, and I can't help advertise ARM a little bit because of my history with it. So companies like ARM didn't consciously set out to do this, but this is what they do. ARM's product is a virtual product. It's a designer productivity product. So it's not something which is directly on the bill of materials, but it's something that helps to make the design process viable. You can reproduce 60 billion transistors quite easily. You just keep stamping them out. But, once, but doing the design, the organization of all of those 60 billion, 60 billion is roughly 10 times the entire population of the world, just to put a scale on it, uh, is something which is a large and complex task. And your company won't be in business without a successful design. And so ARM's infrastructure is a lot more than just providing a CPU block into, the, into an integrated circuit. It includes all of the software tools which, is, which are listed here, but it's also not only for the main CPU chip, but also for pretty well all of the other chips which are inside there as well. They all need to be intelligent these days, and ARM provides a, a convenient way of making them so. So if you look at even the, the SIM, but also at the, um, uh, the memory, the memory uh, chips, the memory chips which often go into IBM PCs. So you could easily ask yourself, how many ARMs are, are there in the average IBM PC? And the answer is more ARM CPUs in there than there are Intel. <coughs> so the ARM CPUs range today from about 50,000 transistors to 50 million. Um, they are this in a, a families of around 24 processors in six families. The idea being that the processes are aimed at different market sectors, different performance profiles that they're trying to achieve. And indeed, we can't just provide, or ARM can't just provide the processes in isolation. It has to provide a methodology in which they can be all hung together. So this one, for example, is one, two, three, four quad cores. So that's four, four, 16 CPUs there. And up here, there's another cluster of DSP processors, which could easily be another 16. This is an example implementation, which when people license ARM technology, they get effectively, here's a circuit diagram, an implementation of all of that. Take out the things that you don't need. Attach the things that you do need. The operating system, the whole design environments, they will all work when you've created this. Here's a suite of test programs which will work with it to help you to, to get it into production. So there's a lot of stuff. The iceberg has an awful lot 
underneath. And so what people who think that this arm is an e easy thing to replicate have got to realize that arm is a lot bigger and wider than it looks on the outside. It's actually very much like a TARDIS. And then, of course, there's partnerships. The other thing that ARM has strength in is around a thousand partners. Around a thousand people, companies, design groups, tool manufacturers, uh, EDA companies, fabs, all see the value in having links into the, this ARM iceberg. Because if they can do that, then they, they are going to have a, a, a route for the use of their tools in end products. And that's a, a very good thing to do because an end product, of course, is what we're all trying to make. An arm ship in 2014, I don't know what the current number is, 12 billion arm CPUs. 12 billion. 7 billion people in the world. That's a good, good number. And had shipped 60 billion in total. That's interesting. You can get, get an idea there of just how fast this market is growing. It shipped 12 billion in 2014 when the total that had been shipped up to that point was 60 billion. So this is a number which is growing between 25 and 50 percent per annum. So that's how fast people are buying into the electronic systems. I won't spend time on that except to say that back in 2016 SoftBank bought ARM for £24 billion. ARM has no manufacturing capability. So it's a very strange thing to buy. Governments don't appreciate it or value it because they really don't understand how uh, these electronic things are difficult. Everybody's producing them these days. They can't be that difficult, surely. So conclusions then. Uh, the planar transistor in the last 70 years has transformed our lives, but society now expects all aspects of social and individual need to continue to improve and it's rightly seen that Moore's law has delivered that up to date and is worried then about what the future is for this. But as the planar transistor approaches the atom size its shrinking must certainly end. Um, is this the end for continuous improvement? Uh, well the alloy of technologies we've seen working together is delivering system functionality which is still going to go up a long way. The transistor is no longer the epicenter of these complex designs and the moves into 3D technology along with more sophisticated design, manufacturing, packaging and so on uh, can maintain and I think will maintain that system level Moore's law, that is the doubling of functionality on an 18 to 24 month cycle will still continue and it will continue with no limitation as far as I can see. There is nothing in front of us probably which constitute, constitutes a significant obstacle for around 30 years. So the size of the silicon atom is forcing a rethink, but then that's what engineers are there for, isn't it? It's to overcome problems. It's not to do stuff which is easy to do. You've got technicians to do that. Problems are the things that you bring engineers to the, to the table for, and that's what they're going to do. It's what we do. That's it. Thank you for listening. I'm in no hurry, but uh, other people might have plans.